RP Plus, RPU, welcome back. Dr. James Hoffman here. Hopefully you had a chance to join me on the basics of physiology videos. Today we're gonna to move on and kind of get to some of our bread and butter for sport and exercise science, which is movement anatomy. So this is gonna be the first video in a series of video that describes some of the things we need to know about in terms of movement and anatomy and physiology. Now this isn't gonna be a full-blown AMP course, so don't have to worry about that. This one is meant to get you up to speed just on some of the terms that you're probably gonna hear in the future when we start describing movement but it's gonna be in the context of sport and exercise sciences. So what we, uh, we wanna get away from saying like to the left or top or bottom or front and back, we're gonna start using a little bit more specific terminology and we just don't want you to get lost along the way. So the goal for today is to get some uh, just general foundational terms down so that when we go forward, we can speak a little bit more clearly about movement relative to the body. So why don't we go ahead and get started? The first thing we have to understand is the anatomical position. Now, the reason why we even have to bring this up is because movement of the body is, on an absolute scale, meaning just my body and time and space can be described any number of ways, which makes it really, really difficult to say like, well, what is front? What is back? What is left? What is right? So we have developed the anatomical position to give ourselves a frame of reference whenever we want to describe either movement or things placed within the body any and all of the above, right? So if we look at the slide, we can see the anatomical position of the skeleton here, right? So we have the person standing upright, standing erect, they have their head facing forward, they have the arms down at the sides, and then you can also notice their palms are up, and then generally it's depicted with the toes pointed kind of down or kind of neutral feet, usually put toes down. So this is the reference point whenever we're describing where other things are located on the body, or if we want to describe something as being on the left or on the right, or if we want to say top or bottom or front to back, this is going to be our frame of reference from this point on. Now, just kind of a weird nitpicky thing. When we're talking about anatomical positions, usually it's done from the first person perspective, right? So if you're looking at this, and looking at the guy, you might say, well, that's his left arm or his left leg because that is the point that you're looking at it. But generally, to be more specific, when we're talking about anatomical position, it would be from the first person perspective, right? So it would literally be what is your right arm and what is your right leg versus looking at it in the 180 degree flip-flop. Make sense? So it's kind of flip-flop, put yourself in their shoes kind of is the way that you would be more anatomically correct. But again, this is the reference point, and we're gonna just describe some directional terms and some movement terms using this as the reference. So let's go ahead and get on to the first couple here. First thing we gotta differentiate is superior and inferior. So superior is a term that generally means above in the body, right? And sometimes you'll see the word cephalic, which means towards the head. And so you can see the orange line, basically anything that's kind of like from the midline up, is generally referred to as superior. Now this can also be a relative term where you could say something is superior in the body to something else, meaning it's located up above or more close towards the head, right? Contrary to that, we have inferior, which is generally meaning below, or we can also use the term caudal, which literally means towards the tail, which would be like your tailbone, your uh, coccyx on the back of your, your hips there. So generally when we say something is inferior, you know, like with the reference point, it would be lower than, or like closer to either the tailbone or the feet, right? That's not super, super explicitly correct, but for our purposes will serve us just fine. So if we say something is superior, generally means it is above. If we say something is inferior, generally means it is below, and that can be relative as well. Make sense? All right, next one. These are pretty easy. Hopefully nothing too crazy here. All right, so the next one is one that we use a lot. Medial versus lateral. So whenever something is described as medial, it is essentially meaning it is towards the midline of the body. Now you can see in the skeleton on this one, we drew an imaginary kind of black line right down the middle, kind of bisecting it into perfect right and left halves, right? So anything that is medial, meaning it will be more close towards the midline of the body, right? Lateral, on the other hand, is kind of the polar opposite of that, meaning away from the midline of the body. So these can be in reference to the anatomical position here, and it can be relative. You could say something is more medial or more lateral to something else, and that's perfectly fine. But anything that is generally referred to as being medial means it's closer to that imaginary bisecting line in the middle, and anything that is lateral, meaning moving out towards kind of the outside of that, or maybe out towards the periphery, depending on how the person is standing. So an anatomical position, you know, the hands and the feet 
are still relatively close to the midline, but if my hands were extended out, right, we could say my hands are pointing out laterally versus medially towards the midline. So there's kind of some absolute with the anatomical position references and there's some relative references when we're actually moving around doing stuff. But again, medial meaning towards the midline, lateral meaning away from the midline. Okay, hopefully nothing crazy yet. Couple other ones we wanna know, anterior versus posterior. So on this one we have two pictures, right? Anterior is really simple. We're basically imagining cutting the body basically into front and back halves, right? So anterior is anything that would be like on the front half, which would be the side with my face, my stomach, my quadriceps, right? Anything along those lines. Posterior is referring to the rear side, the back side of the body. So this would be like the back of my head, all my back muscles, my glute muscles, my hamstring muscles. That's why I often call it posterior chain, right? So anterior front side, posterior back side. Nothing too crazy. Okay. Proximal and distal are the next ones. Proximal is usually, this one can be a little confusing for some people. Whenever we use the word proximal, essentially on a very nitpicky level, we're meaning near the main mass of the body. So we're saying if something is proximal, it's kind of close to the main, like your trunk area of your body. Distal is kind of the polar opposite where we're saying if something is distal, it is generally away from the main mass of the body. So for example, we would say that the shoulder joint would be something that is relatively proximal, whereas your hands or your fingertips, your phalanges, right, are relatively distal, meaning away from the main mass of the body. Why? Because they stick out further. So things that are proximal are generally closer to the middle, whereas things that are distal are generally further away from the middle. And in the example here, we kind of have like the shoulder and hip joints being something that is a good reference point for being proximal. And then we have like the hands and the feet as a good example of something that is generally defined as distal. Now, this is kind of like absolute terms in terms of the anatomical positions, but again, could be relative as well. We could say something is proximal to something else or something is distal to something else, meaning close or far away from something else. Same idea there, but proximal, generally close to the main mass of the body, main, like being the trunk, distal meaning kind of far branching out away from the trunk, okay? Couple other ones, superficial versus deep. This one's pretty easy. Superficial generally refers to anything that's up towards the surface, up towards kind of like the skin level, right? So in this example, we have the first one is the hand. So something that is superficial would mean close to the surface, like up at the skin layer, the dermis layers up here, that would be something very, very superficial. Versus deep, meaning something away from the surface, actually, and as the name implies, kind of deep inside of the body. So something that is superficial, would be like the skin or any of like the subcutaneous fat near the hand, the surface, whereas something that is deep might be like the actual bones inside the hands or something, or even some of the muscles and connective tissue inside the hands, right? So that's just a really simple one, right? So superficial meaning towards the surface, deep meaning uh, not towards the surface, away from the surface, so actually inside of the tissue, uh, burp. Moving on to the next one, we have to start understanding how we actually kind of bisect some of these planes of movement that we're gonna be talking about. So we already had some uh, kind of, we laid down some foundational ter movement terms, you know, like anterior, posterior, medial, lateral. So now we're gonna actually start describing how we kind of talk about the body on a very simple biomechanical level by kind of using different planes of movement that we can break down. So the first one is probably the easiest one, in my opinion, to understand what we call the sagittal plane. If you take a look at the picture, we can see we have imaginary guy there. Essentially, the sagittal plane is an imaginary plane that cuts the body into symmetrical right and left halves, right? What does that mean? Well, that means essentially, if I am looking at something right and left, whether it's anterior right or anterior, uh, excuse me, anatomical right or anatomical left, I can use the sagittal plane to describe movements that are occurring in those right and left halves. So, if we're describing the sagittal plane, that generally means that things are gonna be rotating about what we call the medial lateral frontal axes. Now, planes and axes can be a little confusing for some people. Planes I like to imagine as, I'm gonna use this piece of paper as an example, as just like a flat line, right? Like this, kind of like a big sheet. So in the sagittal plane, essentially it would be like this. It'd be bisecting myself into right and left halves, right? The axis is kind of a perpendicular. I'm gonna grab this pen to kind of describe this. The axes would be something that basically intersects this plane at a perpendicular angle at about 90 degrees. And then you can imagine something moving as this 
uh, you know, this line is rotating, which is kind of funny to think about. So although that is a little confusing admittedly, really what this boils down to is what things are occurring in this kind of plane of motion here that bisects me from left to right. So what type of movements do we typically see? Well, usually we see flexion and extension type movements, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about that in a second. But generally, if we're talking about movements occurring in that sagittal plane, they're gonna be flexion extension movements, and the big ones that we're gonna be using for exercise purposes are going to be things like elbow flexion and extension, shoulder, flexion extension, and then I can't do it because I'm sitting down, but also hip flexion extension. So you can imagine, right, if I am flexing my shoulder up and down, it's occurring in this plane of motion, and that's how we describe that. So that is the sagittal plane bisecting into left and right halves, and the primary movements that we're gonna see are gonna be our flexion extension movements that are gonna be operating within this plane. So let's go on to the next one. The next one is the frontal plane, a little bit different. This one is going to be dividing the body into front and back halves, or anterior and posterior halves. So the sagittal plane was right and left like this, right? The frontal plane would be something like this if it was to cut me in half from front to back, right? And so in this case, we're gonna have a similar idea. We're gonna have things moving about an antero posterior axis. So again, the axis basically is that perpendicular bisecting, or excuse me, that perpendicular line that comes through and then would rotate, and that would be the kind of movement actions that we would see. So in this case, the primary movements that we're gonna see in the body are going to be abduction, abduction, and adduction, adduction. So one has AB, one has AD. So abduction and adduction, and we're gonna talk about that in a little bit. Typically, we see that occurring at the hip and at the shoulder, so abduction would look like this and then a deduction would be back towards, right? So in this case, we have this plane, right? And then the movement is operating within that plane of motion. So before we had flexion and extension like this in the sagittal plane, in the frontal plane, we're gonna have abduction and adduction like this. Make sense? Not too crazy, I hope. And then last one that we wanna describe, pretty easy, I think, for the most part, is the transverse plane, which is gonna be bisecting the body into superior and inferior or top and bottom halves. And in this case, we're going to have a vertical axis. So what that means is if I take my imaginary plane paper here, I'm gonna cut myself into top and bottom halves, and then I'm going to have an axis that is rotating like this. So what we're gonna actually see in this plane of movement, as you can probably see from the picture, are gonna be our trunk rotational movements, right? And that can be medial or lateral, can be all sorts of different things, but here's where we're primarily gonna see anything where we're actually rotating about like this, right? So a good example might be like a baseball swing or a tennis racket swing or something like that, or even like a med ball toss, something along those lines. Make sense so far? So again, sagittal, right and left, frontal, front and back, and then uh, in this one, transverse, top and bottom. Now, not all movement occurs perfectly in those planes, but it's kind of a nice place to start, kind of some groundwork to describing movement. Now, if you've taken the biomechanics course or have seen anything like that before, you know we can usually describe these things in terms of vectors and joint angles, but this is kind of a foundational place to start where we say, okay, what planes are the movements generally occurring in? What are the muscle actions that we're starting to see? What are the movements that we're starting to see at the joints? Really, really basic. Now, again, in real life, does anything operate perfectly in the sagittal plane or perfectly in the uh, frontal plane? No, it's usually a hybrid of some different movements and not all movements are perfectly linear. But again, just developing some groundwork, some foundational terms to talk about human movement. So those are the three big planes that we're gonna be talking about more and more later on. All right, let's move on to the next one. Now we have to start describing some basic joint movements in the body. This is kind of a, I think, I think pretty easy for most people to grasp, though it's kind of a common beginner newbie mistake that we do see a lot. So we're just gonna describe some of the basic movements of joints so we have a pretty good understanding of how we can describe these during exercise conditions later on. So the first two that are worth mentioning, probably the ones we're most interested in, especially summertime working on the guns, flexion and extension. So if we're talking about a joint that is flexing or extending, Essentially, what we're talking about is a joint angle that is either decreasing, 
or increasing. So the common examples that we see with flexion and extension are gonna be the elbow and the knee. And so since we're sitting up like this, we'll use the elbow as a good example here. So for flexion to occur, essentially the joint angle has to be decreasing, meaning the insertion point is moving kind of towards the origin to some degree. So the muscle is shortening, the joint angle is decreasing. For extension, we're gonna see this elbow joint, joint angle actually increasing, right? So flexion, joint angle shortens, uh, excuse me, decreases, extension, joint angle increases. Not too challenging, right? The next two are abduction and adduction. I already mentioned those a little bit. Notice the spelling difference in these. They sound very, very similar. They are slightly different. So in abduction, we're gonna be moving away from the midline of the body. And the way that I like to remember this, a stupid little trick, abduction sounds like abduct. When you abduct someone, you take them away. Same idea here. So abduction would mean away from the midline of the body. So in this case, if we we're talking about my shoulder joint here, if I was doing abduction, I would be taking my arm and moving the distal end away from the body, right? So I have abducted or my arm went away. If I want to do the opposite, adduct, I'll be moving back towards the midline of the body. So in this case, my arm was abducted. To move it back to the anatomical position, I have to adduct, adduct back to the midline. This is a pretty simple one, but it can be a little confusing when we are referring to something not in the anatomical position. So in the anatomical position, it's pretty straightforward, right? We can think about our shoulders coming out to the side like this, or our hips coming out to the side like this. It gets confusing when you have somebody doing something like a bench press, right, where they're laying horizontally and their arms are moving and it becomes kind of the opposite of what you would normally expect. But for the most part, if you think about it on a really simple level, if you're moving towards the midline, it's a deduction. If you're moving away from the midline, you're being abducted. Uh, uh, that's abduction, right, away from the midline. Now, the next one we want to talk about is rotation. Rotation, as you can imagine, just like if you're thinking about biomechanics, is something spinning about an axis, right? Which is what most of our joints do anyway. But when we're talking about rotation, we're going to usually be breaking that down into two, not always, but two pretty simple ones. There's going to be an internal rotation and an external rotation. So if we're talking about something that is internally rotating, that means the movement is moving the joint towards the midline. And so a really, really common example you see in like PT and AT are shoulder internal and external rotation, right? So essentially, if I were to internally rotate my shoulder, that would mean that this part of my arm would be coming back towards the midline. So an internal rotation would be like this. I'm rotating my arm back towards the midline versus an external rotation, I would be moving away from the midline, very similar to AB and AD duction, right? So in this case, I'm gonna be rotating my shoulder away from the midline, done like so, right? So I could also flip it up and do it in a different direction, right? If I want to go external, away from the midline, internal, back towards the midline, same idea. So rotational movements, internal is usually, and this can be done not only with the arm, Right, you can think about the same idea with the lower extremity as well. So anything that's turning towards the midline, internal, turning away from the midline, external. Okay, now we get into some more specific ones that might be for particular joints or particular areas on the body. One that we wanna be specific about for the foot are, uh, is plantar flexion and dorsiflexion. This is another one that people get commonly confused. Plantar flexion is essentially when you are moving your toes away from your tibia. So this is when you're actually pointing your toes down, your heels come up, right? So this is like when you're standing on your tippy toes. That is plantar flexion. So normally we have like flexion paired with an extension. In this case, we actually have two flexions, right? So plantar flexion, again, point, toes pointing down away from tibia. So we're standing up on our tiptoes. The other is what we call dorsiflexion, which is where we're actually gonna be moving our toes up towards the tibia, which again is that big bone, uh, your shin bone, leading up to the knee, right? So in that case, we're actually gonna be moving our toes up off the ground. So the heel stays down, toes come up. That's dorsiflexion. So toes down, heels up, plantar flexion, heels down, toes up, dorsiflexion. So that's one's really specific for the, for the foot. Uh, another foot specific one we have is eversion and inversion. When we're doing, uh, this is one where we're actually looking at the way the ankle moves the bottom of the foot. So generally, if we're talking about something where the sole, the bottom of your foot is rotating towards the midline, that is an inversion. So the soles are facing the midline of the body. If they're facing away from the midline, that's going to be an eversion. So the way I like to think about it, inversion is in or towards the body, inside the body. Eversion is out or away from the body. So if I was to look about my feet, 
and the way that my soul is facing, if my soles are flat and I want to point my soles towards the inside of my body, inversion, if I want to point them away from my, in the midline of my body, out, that would be E version. Make sense? Nothing too crazy. Okay, so those were some specific ones for the feet. We have a couple specific ones for the hands that are not wor noteworthy. We have pronation and supination. Essentially, if we're talking about pronating our hands, we're talking about moving our palms down like this. So we're having our palms kind of facing towards the ground. If we're talking about supination, what we're thinking about is actually turning our palms up. And uh, my anatomy and physiology teacher back in the day, and I'm sure every I'm sure every A and P teacher says the same reference. But the easy way to remember this one, if you get confused, so if somebody's like, is this pronation or supination? The way I like to think about it is supination is making a bowl with your hands, asking for soup, right? So if you were to ask for soup, you'd say, I'd want some, please sir, I want some more. Make a little soup bowl with your hands, you turn your palms up, that's supination. Pronation is palms down. So supination, palms up, pronation, palms down. With me so far? Hopefully nothing too crazy. Okay, couple other ones. Circumduction is kind of a strange one. Circumduction is essentially where we have the origin of the muscle or wherever the, the kind of the proximal end of the joint is, is going to remain relatively fixed, it's not gonna move, whereas the distal end of the joint, or, or whatever the appendage is, is going to actually make a circular motion, right? So I can do this with my arms and my legs. So up here, right, my humerus stays uh, relatively fixed up here in the joint, it moves around a little bit, but it's not moving grossly in time and space here, right? Whereas my hand is basically free to move about wherever it wants and it does it in a circular motion. I can do the same thing with my leg and my hip and make a round circular motion, circumduction. So that one's kind of easy, right? Circle, circumduction. So proximal end stays fixed, distal end makes a circle. Nothing too crazy. And then a couple more specific ones. Elevation and depression are terms that we use to usually, more often than not, to describe the scapula. When we're talking about elevating something, again, usually the scapula, we're talking about raising it up superiorly, right? So if I was to elevate my scapula, I'd be kind of like trying to shrug my shoulders up. And conversely to that, if I was to depress or using depression, I'd be talking about moving something inferiorly or depressing it downward. So elevation would be up superior, depression down, inferior. Usually, again, mostly reference to the scapula. And then another similar scapular one, we use our protraction and retraction. And this is one that you're probably gonna hear a lot when we talk about setting up good techniques for like squatting and bent over rows and bench presses and stuff like that. Protraction is where we're taking the area in question, usually the scapula, and moving it forward or anteriorly. So if I was to protract my scapula, I'd be moving them towards the anterior side of my body, moving them forward, right? Here's me sitting neutral. If I began to protract, that would mean I'd be trying to push my shoulder blades forward. On the other hand, if I was trying to retract, I'd be pulling them back or posteriorly like this. So if I was trying to set up a good squat or a good bench press, right, we usually say retract the scapulas. So that again would be if me, I'm sitting neutral here. To retract, I'm gonna move my scapulas to the posterior or my backside, which will look like this, pulling them back. Notice how that pulls me upright really well too. So really important for good technique. So protraction, forward, retraction, backwards. Anterior, posterior. Make sense? Nothing too crazy. So those are the big ones that we're gonna need to know going forward. Now we kind of went through it relatively fast, but most of you I think are able to grasp this relatively easy. So if you ever need to brush up on these, just go back and go through this lecture again. It's not too challenging. This is something I want you guys to have down and not even really think twice about from this point on. So we should be able to say like, what is this? All right, that's abduction. Or what is this? That's flexion. What is this? That's extension, right? That's the kind of stuff we need to be able to do. Easy peasy, not think twice about it. Now, Within this, we want to be able to accurately describe not only in movement terms, but also in terms of which muscles are actually doing the movement or producing the force in the movement, and then what types of muscle contractions they might be going through. So here on this slide, we actually are addressing a couple things. First thing on there you might see is what we call an agonist, which is something that we refer to as a primary mover for whatever it is that we're doing, right? So there's lots of different activities that we can talk about. Some are sport specific, some are exercise specific. Essentially, an agonist muscle 
is the primary force producing muscle for whatever movement that you're trying to do, right? Now we know that most movements are complex. They don't just involve one muscle group, they usually involve multiple muscle groups. So the agonist muscles are ones that are kind of the primary force producers, right? So a good example might be the bench press, right? Where we have a number of different muscles involved in the bench press. We have all sorts of rotator cuff muscles, even some of our posterior muscles on our backside help stabilize the bench press. But what are the muscles that are actually producing force? Well, for the most part, we know it's going to be the pecs and the triceps, right? Those are going to be the ones that are really pushing that bench out. Are there other muscle groups involved in controlling the movement? Absolutely. But they're not necessarily agonist muscles. They might be supportive muscles. They might even be neutralizing muscles. But the agonist is the one that is producing the most force or producing force in the line of motion, right? So again, primary mover is going to be the agonist. Another term that we can use to describe some of these things are synergists, right? So where we have some muscles that are assisting the agonist in actually performing a given movement, right? And this list can be very, very long for any given exercise. There might be any number of muscles that are assisting in the movement, but they might not be primary force producers, right? This might be because of the way their pination angle is lined up or the way that they're lined up on the joint relative to the movement that they're doing, or it could just be from a sheer size perspective, right? So if we're looking at like rotator cuff muscles, versus like your pec muscles. Well, your pec muscles are huge. They're gonna be able to generate a lot more force than this muscle that's the size of you know, my fingertip or even smaller, right? So we might have some synergistic muscles which can aid the movement in either certain parts of the movement or certain ranges of motion, but are not gonna be the primary force producers for that movement. So the synergist list can be pretty extensive for a lot of different movements and that's totally normal, right? On the other end, we can have antagonist muscles. Antagonist muscles are going to be those which oppose the prime mover. And they're usually located on the polar opposite end of the joint that you're talking about, right? So in this case, we have a picture and we have a nice simple example, right? We have a biceps uh, and a triceps example here. So in this case, we're looking at an elbow joint and we're probably looking at either doing elbow flexion or elbow extension, right? So we know that to do elbow flexion, our biceps here is going to be the prime mover, the agonist muscle. And in order for us to flex, that bicep is going to have to contract and shorten, right? So here, right? But we also know on the polar opposite end, the back end of my arm, this tricep here is a primary uh, elbow extensor, right? So if I was trying to do elbow extension, my triceps would be very active in pushing my forearm outward, right? And opening up that joint into extension. So we know that they have polar opposite roles. So essentially, if we don't control our movement really well, we can actually see these antagonistic muscles very often interfering with the agonist muscles for whatever movement is that's trying to occur. So if I'm trying to do elbow flexion, my biceps will be the agonist, right? But my triceps could also be resisting, whether it's a reflex response or it's just not a quite a smooth coordinated movement yet. My triceps might actually be actively elbow extending, resisting that movement while I'm doing it, and that would be antagonistic. So one of the big, uh, one of the primary reasons we get stronger over time, especially like in the beginning stages when you just start doing lifting, is we can actually smoothen out a lot of these movements. And one of the ways that we smoothen out a lot of these different movement patterns is by actually decreasing the amount of co-contraction, meaning uh, contracting both agonist and antagonist muscles at the same time. And what we see is the antagonists start to cool off over time and allow the agonist muscles to become more and more forceful. In the beginning, they're a little cautious. They're like, whoa, 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 we're not used to doing this. What's going on? I'm going to try and negative feedback, negative feedback, negative feedback, stop what you're doing because this is foreign to me or it's too much force or too much stretch. I'm not used to this yet, right? And that's normal. Over time, as you get more and more trained, that gets toned down. Reflex responses get toned down a little bit and we can see the agonist producing lots of force. So in this case, right, for elbow flexion, the agonist would be the biceps, the antagonist would be the triceps. For tr uh, elbow extension, the agonist would be the triceps and the antagonist would be resisting that movement would be the biceps, right? So usually kind of located on the polar opposite end of the joint. So the same thing we could talk about quadriceps and hamstring, same idea, right? Nothing too crazy there. And then we also want to be able to accurately describe some certain basic conditions of muscle contraction. Now, this is something you're going to learn more and more and more about in the biomechanics course and the exercise physiology courses. But we just want you to be familiarized with some of these terms so that they're not totally foreign or we don't make newbie mistakes later on. So 
when we're talking about muscle contractions, there's three generally main uh, types of contractions that we can talk about. And there's a couple kind of gray areas in between, but these are the three most common things that we're gonna see over and over and over again. The first one you'll see on there is what we call a concentric contraction. And what that is, is a condition where the muscle is actually producing force and shortening, right? So it's actually, and if this example, if we're talking about the elbow, we're gonna see the joint angle decrease. So for a concentric contraction, my bicep is gonna start generating tension and then it's gonna actually shorten, right? So the distal, or excuse me, the uh, insertion end is gonna start moving towards the origin, right? So in this case, I had something in my hand, maybe it was a dumbbell, in this case, or a pen, or maybe I was doing some beer curls, hence my burping, right? So in this case, if I'm doing a concentric contraction, the muscle is shortening in the line of pull, and in this case, the joint angle is decreasing from the elbow, right? That would be a concentric contraction. So the muscles producing force and shortening. On the opposite end, we have what we call an eccentric contraction. This is something that people get confused a lot and where they, um, they confuse eccentric with concentric of an antagonistic muscle. So when we're talking about an eccentric contraction, what we're talking about is a muscle that is producing force. It's generating tension, but now it is lengthening rather than shortening. So in this case, what we started off talking about was a concentric bicep movement, right? Where I shortened my bicep as it produced force. An eccentric muscle contraction is where I'm still producing force with this bicep, but for whatever reason, whether it's voluntary or possibly even involuntary, this is now lengthening out while it's generating force. What we wanna make sure that we're clear about, this is, this is different than doing a forcible tricep extension of the elbow, right? So what we're saying is, my eccentric contraction is kind of the downward phase for a movement where now the muscle is still producing force and lengthening, but I'm controlling it here still with my bicep. So the bicep is doing the concentric and then the eccentric phase. Now it's lengthening under force. What we're not talking about doing is doing a concentric bicep curl and then doing a concentric tricep extension, right? two different things, right? So in the example with concentric and eccentric, my bicep is still doing the work. The tricep is still an antagonist, right? Well, it could potentially be an agonist if I was to try and throw this pen at the camera or across the room, that's not what I'm actually doing. So in this case, it's still an antagonist and the bicep is still an agonist because I'm still producing force in the bicep and now it's lengthening as I go down. Make sense? So we don't want to confuse. That's a really big newbie mistake where people will say, oh, you're doing elbow extension, right? That means you are contracting your tricep muscles. Uh, 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 not necessarily. I could be doing a eccentric bicep contraction and lowering the weight down in control. That's the difference, right? So concentric produces force, shortens. Eccentric produces force, lengthens. And you can see the same example in the slide. And then last but certainly not least is one that we do all the time and we don't think twice about it, is an isometric contraction. An isometric contraction is simply where we're having the muscle produce force, but there's no real significant change in length. We say significant because if I was just to hold my arm still in a relaxed position, right? Nothing's going on. If I contract my arm, even if I don't move it, you can see that there's some movement there, right? The muscle still shortens a little bit simply from generating tension and reducing the slack inside that muscle. That's what we're talking about, right? But my joint angle didn't actually change. So when we're talking about something that's isometric, we're essentially saying no significant change in joint angle. Now, if, we're, if it fudges a little bit here or there, that's normal. So if we were to be really, really nitpicky, right? Like comic book guy from The Simpsons, do we technically asymmetric? Right, so isometric would generally be something where you're producing force and the joint is staying perfectly still. In the real world, in sport and exercise context, we're saying it's staying mostly still, right? It's no significant movement across the joint because there's very rare in any sporting or exercise context where we're doing an isometric and you, tr you truly get no movement. And like I said even before, even if I hold my arm like this, I'm not flexing, if I start flexing, the muscle moves a little bit, right? And that's normal. So it's not a true isometric, but generally we're saying no major change in joint angle. So to review that one, right? Concentric, we generate tension, the muscle shortens. Eccentric, we generate tension, the muscle lengthens. Isometric, we generate tension, 
no major or significant changes in the joint angle. Now, you're going to learn more and more and more about muscle contraction, the physiology behind it, things like length tension relationships, force velocity relationships, all sorts of cool stuff. But we have to be able to accurately describe some of these things before we can get into some of the fun uh, stuff later on when we're describing the muscle actions of like a squat or clean or a bench press or a deadlift. So we want to make sure we understand these things really well. I hope you guys enjoyed this one. Make sure, this might be a good one just to, even though you might have said, wow, man, this one was probably the easiest one we've done so far. That's okay, it's meant to be easy, but watch it one more time and just make sure that you're clear on all the terms because this is something that's gonna come back and haunt you later if you don't have it down now. So definitely make sure you have all the anatomical descriptions down, all the general flexion extension movement terms down, and then just make sure you're really clear about what's concentric, eccentric, and then isometric. So my homework for you will be start thinking about different exercises that you do and which muscle groups are performing what types of contractions and what planes of motion are they occurring and what type of joint movements would you use to describe those movements, okay? Work on that. And we're going to get into some more fun stuff in uh, the subsequent lectures in this series. So thank you very much for tuning in. RP Plus, RPU, it's James Hoffman again signing out. I will see you next time.